One of the reasons I think about this, one of my favorite movies of all time is It's a Wonderful Life. Anyone remember that movie? Now, here Clarence is talking with George Bailey, and he says this, Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many others' life. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? Do you remember how George Bailey thought his life had no value, no meaning, he didn't make a difference at all, and Clarence helps him to understand you have a wonderful life and that you touched so many lives in ways you did not understand or realize. That's why it's so important for each one of you to be here, to worship God today. Let me tell you right now, when you're here, you encourage me. When you're here, you encourage the people in your world. When you're here, you bless other people who are saying, there are other people of like faith who are going through the same journey of life, and they chose to be here to worship God, to encourage me, and for me to encourage them. They have a meaning in their lives, and they touch my life, and I touch theirs. Realize, we don't ever want you to be an awful hole. We need you to be here because you touch lives, every one of you. So if you don't think you have significance or meaning, realize God has never done anything without a purpose. And that you, you have a purpose in being here, and he purposed you to be here, and he purposed you to want to be here. Let me tell you this. You touch lives every time you walk through, this, through those doors. Your life has meaning. And so I want to encourage you. In the moment, we're going to get up. And we're going to encourage each other. And we're going to say, why? Well, one of the reasons why we do this is because I want you to know that the people you hug or fist bump or talk to, you're touching their lives today. And maybe your hug or your smile or your words of encouragement or your words, you know what, I'm going to be praying for you this week, is going to be one of the things that is going to carry them this week in the walk with Christ in this journey through a dark world. You do touch lives. That's why every person here is necessary and important. And so I want to encourage you to get up and, and be a blessing. And don't be an awful hole. We need you here. So let's rise up and encourage each other now. I want to have a conversation real quick for a second. <coughs> this whole year's theme has been around the Word of God. And when, when I think about the Word of God, it's not just some logical book, but it's an emotional book. And I was thinking about this for a moment. And I was thinking about some of the needs of modern day Christians, especially in America. And I thought about our history as a church. I thought about our history in America. I thought about our history of growth and spiritual maturity. And I was thinking about God's Word again as we're emphasizing this theme. And I was thinking about this one moment. I was thinking about a moment where I was with a man who was dying. I, and, and this... I was about 24 years old. I was in my first full-time ministry position. And I got a call saying, can you come to the hospital? And one of the ladies who was a member of our church met me at the hospital doors. And we walked up to the room of her husband. And this was the first time I really saw someone in my ministry really, really agonizing in pain. And 
they started putting him on morphine and some of the other things, painkillers and so forth, and he was going to die. He was going to die within the next day or two. So I remember holding this man's hand and holding his wife's hand. And the whole time, she just held his hand staring at him and just started crying. But that was a very hard couple of days. And then he passed away. And he came up, she came up to me, this woman, and this was a woman who didn't grow up in the church. She didn't grow up in, in the faith, but she came to find Christ, read her Bible, came to worship services. And she cried because her husband was an, was an atheist. And she said something that I remember. She said, my husband never knew God. My husband never knew God. And that is probably the most tragic thing that I could ever imagine for anybody. And, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago that, you know, salvation is really coming to know God himself. And one of the reasons why he never came to know God was he never spent time in his word. He never came to know truth. Now his wife came to worship services. His wife read her Bible every day. Her wife encouraged her husband to read the Bible. But he never chose to. And that was a tragic thing. He never knew God he, because he never knew God's word. But then I think about a good moment. And in fact, this last week made me really smile. And the last few weeks have been making me smile. A few weeks ago, I was in life group and Alex Cox mentioned something about his young adult group. And they were saying, hey, we need, we need a place to hang out. And they jokingly said, hey, how about we go to Micah's house? Ha ha. And I was like, okay. And they started coming. Now, I'm not dictating what they're doing. They're, they're coming up with their own lessons. They're studying their own topics. They're studying the Bible throughout the week. And that's just been encouraging, seeing the study that Alex has been doing and Olivia has been doing. And Bree came and she was excited telling Disney about stuff she's studying. And I was excited because when I was in this uh, group and I was just sitting back and just listening to them, and I was really proud of one of our young men who was part of our group. And he asked this question saying, how do I know God? And when he said that, I was so impressed. And I said, I wish that is a question every human being in the world would ask. How would I come to know God? And my response to him was, the same way you get to know anybody. You spend time with them, but you let them talk. And, get to, and you let them speak for themselves. You know, I don't want people just to know things about God because Micah tells them. I want them to know God because they spent time talking to God in prayer, but also spent time listening to God from his very own mouth, which we know comes from the Word of God. One of the tragedies that I've discovered, especially in the modern church, is a lot of people really don't know God as well as they should. And I know that's a heartbreaking thing. Maybe you're in that position. Maybe you've come to worship services 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years. And if you're really honest with yourself, say, you know, I really didn't know God. I knew things about God. And then when I read about the Pharisees, they knew the scriptures, and, but they didn't know God. And Jesus even made known, if you knew the scriptures, you would actually know it was about me. It was all about me. And I want people to know Christ. I want people to know Jesus. Because oftentimes in my work, people spend so much time focused on their own lives and their own problems and their own struggles. And they talk about them constantly and I, and I validate them and they're real and they're uh, painful and, and so forth. And one of the solutions I tell people is, come to know God. I know that sounds very cliche, but when you come to know God, you come to have the right perspective and the right heart and the right mind. He doesn't magically make every problem go away, but he does get you to think about life differently and think about life eternally. And, and when you think differently, that changes the whole thing. 
when you get so satisfied saying everything in my life may stink but I know God so I'm ahead of everyone else who doesn't know him they may have nicer houses and cars and jobs and more less stress in their lives in various ways whatever it may be but I know God and that's one of the things that I want people to know. And one of the things that I've come to understand is a lot of people don't know how to know God because they've never come to study the Bible. And they don't know how to. And to be honest, I don't blame people. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and you've really never come to know God because you've never been taught how to study your Bible. And one of the tragedies is, I, I imagine, what if I was a brand new Christian? What if I was a brand new Christian, I get baptized into Christ, and then you hand me this book called the Bible? And then say, okay, grow. That's kind of what we do. And I struggle with that because I can tell you, if that was me, I would start like any other book. I'd read Genesis, and then I'd read Exodus, and then I'd fall asleep in Leviticus, being like, what in the world is this book about? Maybe you? Rock barriers, different cloths being sewn together. What? And so a lot of times people get this book and they say, I, should, I know I should read this, but I don't know how. And in fact, one of our young adults in our group, he, after almost everyone else left, him and I were talking, and he said, you know what's really interesting? I used to be very apathetic in my relationship with God because what I would do is I would do the devotional where I'd read two verses, say, oh, that's good, and then I'll say a quick prayer and call it good. I give God three minutes, read two verses, said a prayer, I'm done. And then he said, you know what? When I finally decided, you know what? If salvation is really important, if relationship with God is really important, if life change is really important, maybe I should spend more time in this book that tells me how to do all those things. And so he said, you know, I'm studying for the very first time, and I'm getting really deep into it, and I'm learning so much, and so much I thought I didn't know is actually wrong. And so he started studying his Bible. And I, one of the things that I want you to do is learn to study your Bible too. One of the things I asked some of our greeters to do was, I asked them to hand out a handout. Did everyone get a handout for their family from this morning? Yes. We're not going to cover that, but I want you to have this handout. And if you didn't get one, get one before you leave today, because one of the things that it has is it kind of gives you a simple understanding on how to study your Bible. So that when you stand before Christ, you can say, I don't really have an excuse because Micah had that handout on that day in December. You know, I want you to really read over that handout to say, okay, I want to know God. I want to be saved. I want to remain saved. I want to help save my friends and family. I want to be changed from the heart and, and to the outside. I want to be a brand new person. And so I want you to learn to study God's word because that's the only way you're going to know him. It's kind of like social media and creation. In creation, we know that God exists. It, it's obvious. You go on Facebook, you go on Instagram, you go on Snapchat, you can see people's profiles. You know that that person exists somewhere in the world. But until you start having communication with that person, you don't actually come to really know them. We want to transition from just simply knowing about God to actually knowing God. To not just simply knowing some scriptures, but actually knowing God because of the scriptures. I often think about Elvis Presley. And did you know Elvis Presley was a certified genius? IQ-wise, he was a genius. And every year when he was a child, he, he got offered, there was a scholarship to church camp that whoever could memorize the most amount of passages of scripture would get a free scholarship to camp. And do you know who won every single year? Elvis Presley. And do you know why? He memorized at minimum at least 500 verses of scripture. But if you, if you would have known Elvis's life, he would have been able to tell you there were periods where it was really, really bad. And even the, and his mom was, his stepmom was actually a member of the Church of Christ. And so there was a lot of things that Elvis would go back and say, I knew a lot of scripture. I read a lot of scripture. I knew a lot about God. But I didn't know God. 
And that's one of the things I want to change. If, if your spiritual life has been lacking, if you felt unfulfilled, if you felt empty, if you feel like you're not growing and changing, maybe it's that we need to start getting back to the Word of God and changing how we spend time in the Word of God so that we can come to know Christ accurately. Let Him do the talking. You be the listener. You actually come to know God's character and nature, thoughts, feelings. Do you know God has thoughts and feelings? When you actually let God talk for Himself and reveal, this is who I am. Don't, don't believe what everyone's saying about me, because you might get misinterpretations. That's why if I, if I want you to know me, I don't want you to go and talk with a whole bunch of people, because they may see some bad things that may not be true. I want you to come and talk to me, and know me, see me. And that's kind of what God wants. That's why when Christ came, the living word, by knowing Christ, we come to know the Father. By hearing God speak, as Hebrews 1 makes known, He has spoken through the prophets, but now He speaks through His Son. The one, He speaks through Jesus Christ, who leads to the Father. And so one of the things that I want us to do is learn to study the Bible. And one of the things that we're going to cover is how to study the Bible. And we're going to go through some of these things pretty quickly. And I really want you to spend some time on this handout. And if you have questions, do not be afraid to email me, Facebook message me, text me, Instagram me, whatever you need to do to get a hold of me or one of our elders or whoever. Ask somebody. I would rather you know God and look stupid for not knowing, even if you've been a Christian for 50 years, and say, you know, I've never really known God because I haven't really been taught how to study the Bible. I'd rather that be you than you to look like you know everything about the Bible and then not know God. Because at the end of the day, it's not about appearances. It's about relationship with the Creator. And so one of the things that we see here is the Bible tells us about studying the Word of God. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of Truth. Are we spending time rightly handling the Word of Truth? Do we know God's Word? You know, 2 Peter 3.17-18 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. One of the things is we need to be growing in the knowledge of our Lord. And let me tell you this. The more you grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you're going to grow in the understanding of grace. That's why grace and knowledge here are together in this passage. So do you want God's blessing? Do you want God's forgiveness? Do you want God's mercies? Do you want God's care? Grow in knowledge of Him. Because the more you come to understand God's character and nature, it organically changes your heart. Acts 17, 10 through 12 says this, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the, into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. I want every person in the center world congregation before Jesus Christ, for Christ to look at you and say, you have noble character. Because you examine the scriptures daily to see if what was said was true. You sought me out. You sought to know me. And when you come to know God that way, He does change your heart. Sometimes it'll be a battle. Sometimes it's gonna, He's going to humble you. Sometimes He's going to convict you. Sometimes He's going to show you mercy and grace. And other times He's going to slap you upside the head. But in both cases, He's helping you come to know Him. Are you, are, 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 is Christ going to say that about the church at Center Road? That they were of noble character because they studied God's word daily. And they correctly handled the word of God. And they grew in knowledge of grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To have this, we need to have some attitudes. And we're going to go through some of these really quickly. I'm not going to go through these in depth because they're in your sheet. And they're pretty common sense, okay? 
But here are some attitudes that we need to have. And I, 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 I tell you this, a lot of people think if I read my Bible, pray, and go to church, that I'm going to be this great Christian. Well, those are essential, but your attitude in prayer, your attitude in reading the Bible, your attitude in attending worship, your attitude in serving, all those things actually determine whether or not you're actually going to have those things transform your life. So here's some basic ones. One, show reverence for the word and the one who spoke it. At the end of the day, I want everyone to be able to read the Bible, and sometimes God is going to tell you things you will not like, not, things you will not necessarily agree on when you first time read it. There are going to be things that are going to go against your feelings and your experiences, but at the end of the day, He is God and you're not. And so he's going to say some things, and, that, and you're going to have to say, you know what, even though I don't think this, or feel it, or experience this, he's right. And he's right for a reason. Another one, have humility to be open and learn. Let me tell you this, if you, if you think you know it all, then come and help me preach. You know, always have humility. You know, humility is what's going to open your heart to accepting God's word and being changed by it. Trust the word of God and have faith. Have you ever read the promises of God or the Word of God and said, God, I know it's going to be on your timing, but I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to do this. And I may not get an immediate, Americanized, wanted result, but if I do what you tell me to do, this is naturally going to happen at some point. And in, maybe even in the realm of eternity. Another one, expect delight and conviction. Take joy. Have you ever read passages? People say, when I read the Bible, I get encouraged. Someone sent me a message saying, thank you for sending out Bible verses. It's encouraging me. And, and that's good. But also, a lot of times people don't read the Bible because they don't want to be convicted because they know what God has to say sometimes. Allow God to convict you because that's what's going to change you. Love the Word of God and know it's helping build up your relationship with God. If, if you want to love God, you've got to love the Word. It's simple as that. Desire to understand the Word of God. It takes work. It takes work. It's going to study. Shun perversions of the word and accept what God says. A lot of people are going to misalign the word of God. God has talked about false teachers in every book in the New Testament except for one. Satan took God's word and misused the context in order to even tempt Jesus. So try to not allow man to pervert God's word. Be willing to work and invest in setting. Just like any relationship, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Acknowledge that the Word of God is relevant to your life. A lot of people think, oh, this is some archaic book. No, it's not. Mankind really has not changed all that much. And God cares about you, specifically. And desire to be obedient. When you read something, do it. Here are some purposes. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. To know and love God with our whole being. To accept His salvation and know how He saved us. And let me tell you, when you know how to be saved and you've accepted it, at the end of your life, you're going to have less doubt in whether or not you're saved. And I, I, let me tell you, as a minister, a lot of people have that question when they get closer to their death. Am I really saved? Well, if you trust God's Word and God says it and God does not lie, then trust it. Third, to learn um, to love other people. you got to learn to learn to love other people even. Because sometimes it takes work to love people. You know? To know God's commandments and standards and obey Him. God has a moral standard. And they're actually meant for our good. You know, morality is meant to actually protect you and not harm you. To understand God's interaction with man, we often ask, how does God work among us? Does God still care? Yes, He does. That's why we pray. If, if we prayed and God did nothing then what, what good would prayer be in asking Him to do things? You know, it's really that simple. To know how we ought to live in view of God and eternity. Most people in this world live with a temporary mindset. They think, what can I get today? How can I be pleased today? How can I live within the next five years? That's too short of a question. We need to be asking, how am I going to live in view of eternity? We've got to be who God purposed us to be. And the only way you're going to figure out who God made you to be and purposed you to do is to spend time in God's Word. And when you realize, God values me this much? God trusts me this much? God wanted me to do this this much? He trusts me? 
He blessed me. He gifted me. Think of how much value God put into you to help us know truth and what truth is. And let me tell you this. A lot of the problems you have in life are because of the lies you accept from Satan, the world, and even yourself. I often tell people this. People say, no one loves me. God loves you. No one cares about me. God cares about you. You remember, Satan works in the realm of lies. That's why in John 8, Jesus says he is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And Jesus also says, the truth shall set you free in that same chapter. Now, spiritually, he was talking about that, but we now know in modern psychology, truth also sets you free emotionally and psychologically. And now that's a hard thing to do. And that's why we need to spend time in God's Word because God's truth changes the way we think, changes our perceptions, helps us to train our feelings to be how God wants them to be. Now, that's not very easy. Let me tell you, that is one of the hardest things you are ever going to do because Satan is constantly trying to lie to you. He wants you to think you have no hope, you have no value, and there's no possibility for improvement or change. There's no joy. That's what Satan's telling you every second of the day. That's why we need to spend time in this world where God says, he's a liar. Let me tell you the truth. Hope, love, faith, they remain. And it helps to know God's promises and to accept them. Do you even know what God has promised you? I tell people, figure out what God promised you, trust them by faith, and start accepting them. It may not be on your timing, but it, he, he has never failed to fulfill a promise. Another one, to know God's will and to be equipped to do it. Every one of us has been called to do God's will. And we need to do it. Now, I, I'm going to have a list up here in a moment, but I really don't want to go through them. I want you to go through this handout because on one of the sheets, it goes through a lot of the different Bible study resources that you have. And if you don't have a Bible app on your phone, put it on there. And a lot of the resources that I listed in this handout that I gave out to you, a lot of them are now in those Bible apps. Now, you've got to be careful with some of the content, understandably. But we have it easy. Now, why is this so important? I want us to realize that we are the, one of the most blessed generations to ever walk on this earth. Why? Because we have resources that the first century church did not even have. That a thousand years ago they did not have, or even a hundred years ago, and even ten years ago. No, one would, no, no American would really be able to stand before God and say, oh, I didn't have any potential resources offered to me to know you. I want to tell you, we have more archaeology, more study materials, more commentaries, more word studies, more linguistics of everything than we've ever, ever had in human history. Now, I'm going to ask Kevin to play a video. And I want you to think about all these Bible resources we have. And in this video, it's coming from an old TV show. Anyone ever seen the TV show Boy Meets World? It was really popular in the 90s. Okay. Now, there's a teacher by the name of Mr. Feeney. He's actually considered one of the most popular um, pop culture teachers on t uh, in television history. But he's going to make a remark about the availability of information in the modern age. Now, granted, this was in 1997 or 1999. And so we're even 20 years removed from this. But the message that Mr. Feeney gives is very good. So let's play that video. For the first time in history, the common man had access to the same information that used to be available only to the privileged few. And who would you like me to make this up to, my darling? Gentlemen, <laughs> might I interrupt your press junket? There's some learning going on here. <clears throat> Maybe you feel it's important to learn that Gutenberg invented the printing press, but uh, pop culture and these pouty lips have made me a star. <laughs> I'm going to try to put this as kindly as possible. The show has turned into a circus, and you three 
are driving the tiny car. <laughs> Mr. Feeney, I, I mean, I, I'm proud that I knew that Krusty the Clown was the son of a rabbi. Can I ask a real question, Mr. Feeney, about the Tigris and the Euphrates? Miss Lawrence, I would never deny you your moment in the sun. But knowledge fever no longer has much to do with the kind of knowledge I would want you to absorb. Mr. Feeney, look. Well, the show's proving that we're absorbing the right type of knowledge, right? I mean, that's why we're the champions. Champions of what, Mr. Matthews? Of a generation whose verbal and mathematical skills have sunk so low when you have the highest level of technology at your fingertips? Gutenberg's generation thirsted for a new book Every six months, your generation gets a new web page every six seconds. And how do you use this technology? To beat King Cooper and save the princess. Shame on you. What did you think of that video? Thank you, son. But his message was right on. Can you imagine, now you can take what he said, every six seconds a new website, you can now say every six seconds a new app is being developed. We are at a time where resources to know God are at its greatest level ever in human history. And we have it all. Here's a... Well, read your hand out on that. I want you to really think about that, those, thank you, Kevin, those study tools. And we'll skip the rest of the slides here, but I really want to finish by saying this. It's never too late to come to know God the right way. It's never too late to study and to know God. Maybe you're embarrassed. Maybe you're one of those people that's been a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years, but you've never come to say, I actually know God. I know some things about God. I may have even gotten baptized, but I don't really know God. You know, let me tell you this. I don't ever want to come to the hospital again as a minister. And I don't want to come to the hospital as a minister at, at, when you're sick and on your deathbed with you or your spouse saying, I never knew God. I never knew God. And have your wife or your husband there in tears saying, he never knew God. He didn't know him. Yeah, he went to church every once in a while. He put a few dollars in the plate, but he didn't know him. If he did, maybe he would have radically lived differently. Maybe he would have put Christ first. Maybe he wouldn't have done this or that. Is that you? It's time for us to know God. And let me tell you, if every single person in this room will come to know God, life will be better. Not easier, not comfortable in the way that we would perceive, but it would be better. Especially in view of eternity. Because He fills the heart and soul in ways that nothing else ever will. And he will walk beside you when no one else will. And he will care for you when other people abandon you. It's time for us to know God and to serve God. If every person here will fully commit themselves to spending time in God's Word and to fully know Him, I can tell you within one year this whole church would be transformed. I'm not talking necessarily numerically, but I'm talking about the character and the nature and the fervor and the passion and the zeal and the joy and the hope and the excitement and the faith would radically be different. If every single person said, I will spend time with God, not the five minutes and then an hour on TV, but time with God. And let me tell you, people in the world are attracted to people who really know God. You want to know how to evangelize? Know God first. Because then they'll be drawn to you. And they'll say, I want to know who you know. 
that until you come to know God rightly, don't be surprised if, if life is harder, if life is meaningless. Because we were made for Him and His glory. But let me tell you, it is the most exciting adventure, the most passionate relationship, the most fulfilling thing in your life when you come to know God on a radical, biblical way. So take that handout that I gave you and really study it. And if you have questions, you contact me this week. Let this be the day where you begin to know God. I don't care if you've been a Christian one day or 60 years. Today is the day all of us at Center Road are just going to say, Today, I'm going to know God, spend time in His Word. I don't care if I'm a teenager. I don't care if I'm 80. Today, I'm going to study God's Word and to know Him. You want to know why we study the Bible? It's not to know a whole bunch of facts. It's to know God. Let me tell you this right now. The main purpose of studying the Bible is to know God. So church family, let's know God. Make sure you have a handout. Ask me, be a part of our life groups. Come to our Bible classes. Come to our Bible studies. Join a life group. So that every time you have more opportunities to know God and to know God together, which helps you grow faster. So if today you need us to help you grow, and if you want us to encourage you or you want to give your life to Christ, we give you an opportunity to come and obey the gospel, to repent and be baptized as the Bible tells us to to be forgiven of your sins and help us to walk alongside you as you grow deeper in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do that now as we stand and sing.